The speaker of this session this is uh, Jochen Rüdiger from the University Hospital of Basel from the Emergency and uh, Lung Department. And he will talk about non-invasive ventilation in acute heart failure. Dear Ruby and dear Professor Flammer, thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk in front of you. Um, I'm here because of some experience on the um, uh, during our collaboration with the emergency ward in St. Gaon, um, and um, I'd like to talk about the non-invasive ventilation in acute heart failure, which is directly between the emergency ward and the pulmonary ward and cardiologists. I have no conflict of interest. Um, the, um, um, acute heart failure is associated in more than 60% with dyspnea on exertion or dyspnea at rest and um, is um, going to a cardiopulmonary edema in about 3% of cases. There, it is close to the respiratory failure, of course, to the emergency department, and we get more close to the pneumology department, and this is, is where I am. And this is why we want to treat it. Dyspnea is a symptom in general on one hand side, and we want to change those symptoms of the patient. On the other hand side, cardiopulmonary edema is something we should treat fast, so time matters. We end up with symptoms, and we end up with time, and we should treat as soon as possible so we can get into the treatment of the cardiopulmonary edema, which may be a myocardial infarction. This is a general timeline. So um, what you see is it takes some time to think of non-invasive ventilation, which are the first 15 minutes here on the emergency ward in 63 patients. And then it takes about eight minutes on average to start a non-invasive, uh, to set up the non-invasive ventilation and for the team to come. Um, I'd like to, to go, um, uh, those are the topics of my talk. Um, I want to go to the um, definition of the uh, non-invasive ventilation and the acute heart failure, um, whether the non-invasive ventilation um, changes mortality. I mean, we have a decrease um, ejection fracture in some of those patients. Maybe we increase the mortality. Um, then are there benefits to the patients? Um, um, then uh, what do the current guidelines tell us about the um, treatment with non-invasive ventilation, acute heart failure, and a case? And finally, how do we treat no, um, acute heart failure in, on Swiss emergency wards? This is a questionnaire Roland Bingis and I did. So the first part is, um, Acute heart failure is a gradual or rapid change in heart failure signs and symptoms resulting in a need for urgent therapy. So it's time and it's symptoms. Non-invasive ventilation is nothing else than a method. We apply pressure, administration of ventilatory support without using an um, invasive artificial airway. Here in this talk, I summarize CPAP and um, um, NPPV, so a, um, a non-invasive positive um, airway pressure. Um, because in all studies, basically, um, they end up with almost the same results. For those who do not know something about non-invasive ventilation, um, this is kind of the time schedule as time matters, as I said before. So we apply oxygen. Um, we go for, we adapt the mask here. The oxygen is adapted to the mask. Then later on, um, we let the patient breathe through the mask, through the mask here. The tube is not connected to it. And there's a certain point of time. It takes us those eight minutes when we start uh, non invasive ventilation or CPAP. A CPAP, non-invasive ventilation, on a stellar ventilator. Um, this is how it looks like on the emergency ward. You see it uh, some, um, very clear, a lot of lines. The patient is sitting upright, 
And here he has a respiratory rate down to 88. It was 130, and this oxygen saturation is up to 95%. When he came, he was at 85 with 10 liters of oxygen. This down here is a capnograph, which is measuring CO2 in real time. So um, this is what we reached, which we want to reach with all those treatments. So here we have a mortality graph, probability of death here, higher than there. Down here, there's non-invasive ventilation. And now, what is this study about? This is the largest study I've found about, non, about intubation versus non-invasive ventilation. And um, eight years retrospective analysis, those were patients with myocardial infarction in a single center. So they had 1,610 patients, and um, um, one-tenth got NIV, and one-tenth got um, endotracheal intubation. And then you see it almost 25% rate of death in those patients who were invasively ventilated, whereas patients who got non-invasive ventilation um, are much lower, less than 10%. Um, unfortunately, there are also patients which show um, almost the same death rate. Those got oxygen. Um, well, so we don't know what's going on in those patients. It's just selection of the patients. In this study um, population data, there was no real difference between those patient groups. But um, they had a tend to have a higher troponin in the endotracheal intubation, a bit more um, ST elevation myocardial infarction, but that was not significant. There was a study of Contel who showed that um, non-invasive ventilation could lower the rate of endotracheal intubation um, from 15 to 5% in one single study. And so we thought well, maybe this might change um, um, the mortality if we use um, non-invasive ventilation in um, cardiopulmonary edema. There were 10 studies, approximately 10 studies, showing um, that um, there is a decrease in mortality until this study came up with a um, nice name of those uh, Golden Robert of Star Wars, the 3CPO trial, was published in um, 98 in the New England Journal of uh, Gray et al. And they were able to show there is no change of mortality. So, again, it's a disappointment for all those doing applying pressure in patients with heart disease. Um, at least we do not have an increase in mortality, but we definitely have no decrease in mortality. There are some meta-analyses suggesting, well, there might be a change, but so far, this is the largest number of patients uh, randomized to non-invasive ventilation or oxygen in a one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio, um, which can't be denied. We have no change of mortality with the current machines, at least I, I think so. So what do we change with the non-invasive ventilation? Do the patients have a benefit? There are a lot of studies, and last year, Christian Horvath in St. Gallen, he's now in Bern, he performed a study on patients um, with acute respiratory failure. 20% of those had a cardiac um, had had a ca cardiopulmonary edema. Those patients arrived on the emergency ward with a severe dyspnea on the box scale down here with the red dots there, and they had a high respiratory rate around 30 per minute. We applied non-invasive ventilation within 15 minutes, and we were able to decrease um, the respiratory rate and the dyspnea score within one hour to a normal range in almost all patients, including all cardiac patients. So the patients profit from it. There were two patients who rejected the therapy, only two, which is 5% in that setting. 
So I think we should offer, from a symptomatic point of view, non-invasive ventilation if we do not delay the, the treatment of the underlying cause of the cardiopulmonary edema. All studies, and um, as I said, there are many in meanwhile, change the current guidelines of treatment. The treatment recommendations here for the European um, Society of Cardiology said in green, non-invasive ventilation, including um, CPAP or um, NPPV, um, should be considered if respiratory rate is higher than 20 and the blood pressure is also higher than 85 millimeters of mercury, although there are really no studies about that topic. What do the pneumology say? Well, there is a current guideline of the um, um, German Respiratory Society. Um, in, two, two, um, in 2015, Westhoff published that um, recommendations in patients with hypoxic acute respiratory fa um, um, failure due to cardiac cause, cardiopulmonary edema, they also, sh next to, to oxygen, they also should start CPAP therapy. And CPAP should be started um, instead of non-invasive ventilation, um, if possible, and um, it should not, it should never delay cardiologic interventions like catheter. Well, I think that's a clear statement what the current guidelines say. So they include the non-invasive ventilation in heart failure, but it's definitely not the first-line treatment. I'd like to, to uh, introduce a case. It's, tip, uh, it's, typical, for, uh, it's typical for those patients. It was an 80-year-old female arriving on the emergency ward. She was um, normal weight. She is non-smoker. She had severe dyspnea and denied chest pain. That Asiatic woman arrived by ambulance, sat prefer preferably, um, but could be investigated, could lie flat for, for uh, half a minute. Um, there was an EKD um, performed who did not, not show any specific signs of um, acute myocardial ischemia. A EFAS was done, so a lung ultrasound. Roland Pingisa talked about yesterday, could exclude a pneumothorax and showed curly B lines. Um, the patient was hypertensive. She was tachymneic. She was tachycardic. With two liters of oxygen, she had an um, oxygen saturation of 94% and enormous CO2. She was severely dyspneic, so this is the Bork visual analog scale, and reached 7 of 10 points. She was applied, uh, we applied um, um, a nitro patch, two nitro patches. She was considered to be um, 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 overloaded with fluid, so she got furosemide, and after she did not improve within 15 minutes, NIF was considered, NIF was started, and we, um, after we, ex we included, she was tachymneic, she had severe dyspnea, and all of those comorbidities, so um, Glasgow Coma Scale less than 10, she was not agitated, she was not vomiting, she had no pneumothorax, she did not have a metabolic acidosis, they were all excluded, so we could start. And this is what we got. Um, the respiratory rate changed within 15 minutes from 30 to 17. Um, and um, then after half an hour, we asked her about uh, her dyspnea score, and it was only three, which is mild. Um, basically, that patient um, had a hypertensive crisis. She did not have um, um, myocardial infarction, despite that she was turned out to be troponin positive, and she got an antihypertensive treatment and could be discharged later. So, how do we treat in Switzerland our patients with an um, acute cardiopulmonary edema? We did a questionnaire. We wrote emails to all the heads of the departments, um, of the educating Swiss emergency departments, and we asked them, how do you use non-invasive ventilation? Do you think it's useful? Do you think it's 
uh, uh, resource demanding. Um, and um, do you know, and now I ask you all, do you know there is a job code in um, 2016 in Switzerland for non-invasive ventilation outside of the intensive care unit? All right. So do the people from the emergency ward. So um, it might be reimbursed um, in the next years. So we had a, um, about 50% of the people from the German part of Switzerland uh, responded to it, and it was 30% from the French-speaking part. None of the two Ita um, uh, Ticino um, hospitals responded. And um, the respondent said, in the Swiss German region, only 30% use non-invasive ventilation on the emergency ward. In contrast, the Swiss Roman, they use it in 100%. They have a much better infrastructure, obviously, and this is well known. Now, do the people think it's not helpful to their patients? And we ask them, do you agree or not agree that it's a cornerstone therapy or that it's an important treatment or that the patients profit from therapy. And then on the other hand side, does it need a lot of resources of your emergency ward? Well, let's look what they say. 80 to 100% say it's cornerstone therapy, important treatment, and the patient profit from the non-invasive ventilation. But on the other hand side, it's almost 50-50. They say, well, it's a problem, obviously, of resources they have. So we end up with a problem of resources so they cannot use a treatment where patients profit from therapy. And then we ask them about, do, they know, do you know that there is a special job code so a treatment code for your patients if you do non-invasive ventilation outside the intensive care unit. And I have to tell you, 50% or more of the patients getting non-invasive ventilation, at least in the studies and also in St. Gallen, do not go to the intensive care unit afterwards. So they stay outside of the intensive care unit and they are not paid so far. And it's 80% are unaware that there is the job code. If we do not code that job code, we will lose it. So we have to take that advantage. Use it now. We should know how much money we can get because we, have, we spend resources. And then we can have the people who can do the non-invasive ventilation. In summary, non-invasive ventilation, acute heart failure is symptomatic. Time matters, but it's not time is lung, time is hard or whatsoever. It helps against the system, the symptoms of the patient. It's a powerful and demanding tool. It should be considered if there's a persistent severe dyspnea and hypoxemia or hypercarpnia, and it appears to be better implemented by Swiss Romans than the German Swiss areas. I'd like to thank Mayim, of course, Martin Brutsch and Christian Horvath from St. Gallen, Diana, Michael Tam, and Roland Bingisa